Good morning, everyone. My name is Jashvini Amitalingam, and I'm a graduate of Seba University School of Medicine. Today, I'm going to present on the topic of multiple sclerosis. I would like to thank AMIQT Rotations in affiliation with George Washington University for providing me with this opportunity, particularly Dr. Bernard, Dr. Stein, and Dr. Naka. So without further ado, I'm just going to jump right into the presentation, starting off with a brief clinical vignette. A 34-year-old working female with no past medical history and a mother of two was happy, healthy, and successful until she started having difficulty walking. She tried to ignore the problem. However, it started to get worse that one day a client asked her if she had been drinking. Another day, she fell down to the ground in front of her boss. The patient's doctor diagnosed her with a middle ear infection, but it was only when the antibiotics failed to improve her balance and gait that she visited a neurologist. After four months of testing and waiting, this patient was diagnosed correctly. She had multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis or MS is a disorder of unknown cause characterized clinically by a relapsing, remitting or progressive course. So for the outline of this presentation, I'm gonna start off with the definition, moving on to the history and epidemiology, continuing on with etiology, pathophysiology, then going on to clinical presentation and diagnosis, and finally concluding with treatment. So the definition, we all know that multiple sclerosis is a neurological condition. It's the most common neurological disability in young adults in the Western world, and there is no known cure. It's a chronic and multifocal demyelinating disease of the central nervous system. Pathologically, scattered areas of inflammation, demyelination, and gliosis, which is scarring, are seen. And this is more predominantly seen in the brain, spinal cord, and the optic nerves. So when it comes to the history, Back in 1395, Lidwina of Holland, a Dutch nun, presented the first clinical symptoms of multiple sclerosis. At age of 16, she suffered from weakness of the legs, intermittent pain, and vision loss. It wasn't until 40 years later that French neurologist Jean Martin Chacard recognized multiple sclerosis as a separate disease entity. He termed this La Sclerose en Plaque, which is a French translation for multiple sclerosis. In 1868 is when he termed multiple sclerosis as a distinct entity, and he was able to examine a young woman who presented with new onset tremor, slurred speech, and abnormal eye movements. He's also very famous for the well-known Charcot's triad, which is dysarthria, nystagmus, and tremor. So epidemiology. Multiple sclerosis actually has a very unique epidemiology. In the United States, the prevalence is of nearly 350,000 cases. The annual incidence rate is 1.5 to 11 per 100,000. It's important to note that the highest rate is seen in women, particularly between 20 to 40 years of age. Um, as well, younger children and older adults can also be affected with multiple sclerosis. Northern European ancestry is more common, and geographically speaking, the temperate zones is where we see the highest um, rates of multiple sclerosis. Highest global prevalence is in the Orkney Islands, which is just a little north of Scotland. Every year, there are approximately 10,000 people who are diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. So the Orkney Islands, what is this mysterious relationship between multiple sclerosis and Orkney Islands, and why is there such a high global prevalence for this part of the globe? Recent research, particularly um, clinical trials that have been published in June 2021 of this year in the European Journal of Human Genetics, have examined exactly this. The title of their paper is Contribution of Common Risk Variants to Multiple Sclerosis in Orkley and Shetland. And they examined to see if there was any predisposing factors that could be attributed to patients living in this particular part of the globe. In particular, 32 independent genetic effects within the MHC on chromosome six was associated. The majority of these variants had an odd ratio ranging from 1.05 to 1.20. The strongest association was between HLA-DRB1 1501 variant, and, and the astonishing odds ratio there was 2.92. What this indicates is that the patients living in Orkney Islands had a, has it, had a unique allele frequency that was more common compared to the other patients um, with multiple sclerosis in other areas of the globe. The SNP RS927169 was also associated with a significantly higher risk allele frequency in Orkney compared to Shetland and mainland Scotland. So factors in the role of multiple sclerosis. Now that we know a little bit of about the genetics, are there any other risk factors that we should think about? And there's genetic susceptibility in combination with environmental factors that can lead to this immune process. So do we have clues for in, in other environmental factors? And the answer is yes. When we look at the globe, there's an uneven geographic distribution. The equatorial regions have a much lower incidence when we compare to the southern and more northern parts of the globe. 
Furthermore, when we look at migration studies, an individual between before the age of 15, once they migrate to a higher risk area, they're at an increased risk of developing multiple sclerosis. As we can see here from the world distribution map, when we're at zero where the equator is, there's a low risk. But the more north and the more south we go, as we can see in red, the higher the risk. So we can see here Canada and Europe with the highest risk and also closer to the lower border here, lower equator, um, Australia. So evidence of genetic factors. We, we know from the Orkney studies that there are some alleles that are more commonly associated in patients with multiple sclerosis. Are there evidence of any other genetic factors? And the answer to this is also yes. When they examined concordance in monozygotic twins, if there's a twin that has multiple sclerosis, there's a 60% risk of developing multiple sclerosis in the other twin. Furthermore, clustering in the families has also been noted. First degree family members have a three to 5% risk of developing multiple sclerosis. Up to date, a total of 233 genetic variants have been associated with multiple sclerosis. Also, the DR15 alleles, DQ6, and also the HLA-DR2 allele. So this is just a one page summary slide to indicate that environmental factors and association with genetic predisposition leads to this immune dysfunction. Other environmental factors that are also currently being examined are low vitamin D, smoking, exposure to Epstein bar, bar virus, BMI, and the immune process here is demyelination, axonal degradation in the central nervous system. So we mentioned earlier that predominantly women between the ages of 20 and 40 um, come in presenting with clinical signs and symptoms of multiple sclerosis. So what causes this demyelination and why does it occur so suddenly? There has to be some sort of an event or initiation or even trigger factor. And one postulated theory is exposure to viruses and bacteria, or in other words, exposure to an infection. So this is just a slide that I've created to illustrate this concept, molecular mimicry. So in a normal situation, we would have a T cell that would mount an immune response against bacteria and viruses. The microbial protein genetic makeup may be identical to that of the myelin protein. And when this occurs, this T cell is not able to differentiate between bacteria and myelin, thinking that myelin is also foreign. This is when an immune response will be mounted against myelin, starting the destruction and demyelination process, which we see in multiple sclerosis. So the most accepted theory is that exposure of a genetically susceptible individual before the age of 15 to environmental factors are at an increased risk of developing immune-mediated inflammatory demyelination. So pathophysiology, now that we understand a little bit more about multiple sclerosis and its epidemiology, what exactly occurs on a molecular level and how does this demyelination process occur? So the first event that, that happens in multiple sclerosis is a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. So as we can see here from the image, the blood-brain barrier is very tightly regulated to what can enter the central nervous system. So in, an, in multiple sclerosis, T cells and B cells start invading into the central nervous system. They, they're able to cross the blood-brain barrier and they release um, immune components such as immunoglobulins, TNF-alpha, and they start this process for demyelination. This process continues on to form gliosis and plaques, and plaques can range between one millimeter to several centimeters. We're predominantly in the central nervous system, the areas where we see these plaques on MRI are in the brain, the spinal cord, and the optic nerves. So what I have here is a video just to illustrate this concept. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play the video and I'll come back right after. Pathophysiology of MS. CNS lesions are a hallmark of MS and are caused by immune cell infiltration across the blood brain barrier that promotes inflammation, demyelination, gliosis, and neuroaxonal degeneration, leading to disruption of neuronal signaling. Initially, autoreactive CD4 positive T helper cells are activated. The initial trigger could be in the periphery or alternatively in the CNS or with reactivation in the periphery. The robust and early effects of B-cell therapy on relapsing MS suggest that B-cells may function as key antigen-presenting cells for pathogenic CD4-positive T-cells in MS. Activated CD4-positive T-cells increase the immune response by recruiting additional immune cells. After crossing the BBB, CD4 positive T cells are reactivated by antigen presenting cells. T cells, B cells, and antigen presenting cells enter the CNS 
where they secrete the cytokines, lymphotoxin, and TNF-alpha that damage the oligodendrocytes. These cytokines can amplify local inflammation by activating microglia and astrocytes. Microglia can induce myelin phagocytosis and cause increased reactivation of CD4 positive cells. The close proximity of areas with prominent axonal loss and inflammatory infiltrates suggests that neurodegeneration is closely associated with inflammation. Meningeal B cell rich lymphoid aggregates may also injure underlying cortical neurons. B cells, autoantibodies, and complement factors enter the CNS once the inflammation process has started, causing additional CNS damage in the following two ways. First, B cells provide co stimulation to autoreactive T cells and can act as antigen presenting cells to T cells. And second, B cells may produce autoantibodies that bind to CNS tissues, leading to increased autoreactive T cells and monocytes at the site of inflammation. B cells may also produce myelin specific antibodies and other molecules that cause myelin destruction. Okay, so now moving on to the clinical presentation. How do patients with multiple sclerosis present in the clinic? Patients initially have a difficult time describing their symptoms as their symptoms appear and subsequently resolve. These symptoms are affecting different parts of the body at different points in time. And the terms used here are dissemination in time and dissemination in space. The most common presenting symptoms are sensory symptoms, motor function, and visual issues. So with regards to the presenting symptoms, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna list the symptoms based on the central nervous system um, that is affected. And I found that this might be an easier way to remember um, the disease process. So when demyelination occurs, it's an oligodendrocytic attack. This can be acute or it can be chronic. If it's acute, we have transient deficits and remyelination is still possible. Important to note is also the UTSOF sign, which is a conduction block or decreased action potential velocity, which we can actually examine. And a chronic lesion would lead to more permanent deficits. In this case, it's axonal loss and sclerosis, and remyelination will not be possible. So when there's a lesion in the spinal cord, patients can come in with sensory abnormalities such as paresthesias, pins and needle-like feeling, numbness. When there's um, a lesion in the autonomic uh, nervous system or autonomic abnormalities, patients may complain of more generalized symptoms such as urinary frequency, constipation, urinary retention, and regards to the upper motor neuron symptoms, they may present with weakness, spasticity, and even a positive Lipinski sign. So lesion in the cerebellum, patients may present with a more robust finding, such as coordination abnormalities, and this can be confused with other neurological conditions, so ataxia, intention tremor, and dysarthria. For lesions in the cerebral cortex, cognitive and psychological abnormalities are possible, and this can be misinterpreted for psychological conditions, so memory loss, anxiety, fatigue, and emotional um, instability may be possible as well. Moving on to the eyes, so there's two possible, um, two important lesions to remember here. So lesion in the medial lateral fasciculus can lead to internuclear ophthalmoplasia, where patients may present with gaze palsy, nystagmus, and diplopia. Furthermore, lesion in cranial nerve 2, called optic neuritis, is a very common presenting symptom for patients with MS, and they may have pain on eye movement and visual loss. So it's very important to remember that when you do the neurological exam, especially for patients with a, a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis at the back of your mind, uh, when you're doing the eye exam, to just ask the patient, you know, if they have any pain on movement, and if they see, um, you know, double vision, if they have any type of eye symptoms, is something that you want to think about. So in most cases, the initial symptom is blurring of vision. So red-green cover um, confusion or even temporal blindness is possible. The optic neuritis tends to be monoocular, and they may also present with something that's called phosphenes, which is flashes of light. Especially in a woman between 20 to 40 years of age, this can be easily confused for migraines. The presentation between um, younger patients and older patients may differ slightly. So in a younger patient, you may see more of a focal acute presentation for, this, for their symptoms, whereas in an older patient, it may be more progressive and more generalized, such as bladder and bowel impairments. So the diagnosis. So we know that the symptoms can come and go. They're in different points in time and different points in space. So how exactly can we make the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis? So there's four important things to keep in mind. Blood work, CSF, MRI, and evoked potential. 
So when it comes to blood work, it's important and it's easy to do a blood work just to exclude some, uh, some medical conditions which may mimic unclinical presentation, multiple sclerosis, autoimmune conditions and infections such as collagen vascular diseases, um, endocrine abnormalities, sarcoidosis. It's an easy, quick blood test and generally these results will be normal in patients with multiple sclerosis. So then we can move on to the other diagnostic modalities. When it comes to the cerebrospinal fluid, oligoclonal bands, particularly two or more bands are seen in 90 to 95% of cases. Intrathecal immunoglobulin G is also elevated. So all, all in all, immunoglobulin G, the immunoglobulin G index, and also the oligoclonal immunoglobulins are elevated. And this makes sense because if it's an immune process and we have inflammatory cells in the central nervous system, this will be elevated. It's important to know that this is not specific, but highly suggestive for multiple sclerosis. And this is just an illustration to show that in a patient without um, any uh, MS, um, the oligoclonal bands will be absent. However, in a patient with MS, you can see the bands right here. Now moving on to MRI. So MRI is actually the procedure of choice for diagnosis and also for monitoring the disease progression. This can show lesions in the brain in about 90 to 95% of the cases, and also in the spinal cord in 75% of the cases. We can also see lesions in the corpus callosum, the brainstem, the spare cerebellum as well. The important characteristic finding that we can note is periventricular signs in Dawson's figures, which I'm gonna show later on. So this is a diagnostic approach that I've obtained from the American Academy of Family Physicians. And I found this to be a nice flow chart, a quick and easy way to, to, um, to figure out or help aid when should we go with an MRI. So we know the criteria, we need two or more attacks with objective evidence with two or more deficits. So basically what this means is two neurological deficits separated in space and time. If we have this, the diagnosis is confirmed. If we have two or more attacks, we have satisfied the criteria for time, but if there's only one deficit, we have not satisfied the criteria for space. So in this case, we would need to perform the MRI to see if there's dissemination in space. On the contrary, when we have one attack with objective evidence of two or more deficits, we have satisfied the criteria for space, but not for time. So we would need to perform an MRI to see if there's dissemination in time. And when we have only one attack with objective evidence of one deficit, we would need to perform an MRI to confirm if there's both dissemination in space and time. If we get a positive result with our MRI, we can stop there because the diagnosis is confirmed. However, if we're still not able to form a diagnosis, we can wait for a second attack and at the same time considering other causes such as medications, psychiatric diseases, genetic disorders. These are all things to think about as well. And this is a wonderful image that I've obtained from the Calgary Guide, and this shows the MRI lesions characteristic seen in patients with multiple sclerosis. So we can see here the classic optic nerve lesion um, right here. We can also see the Dawson's fingers that I was talking about. It's, um, it's a periperpendicular, perpendicular periventricular plaques that we see, and we can also see ovoid lesions. And this is characteristic for multiple sclerosis. Another uh, important um, area of the brain where you may see um, abnormalities in an MRI are the cerebellar peduncle, and we hear, see here the hyperintense lesions. And finally, the evoked potential. So we know that demyelination of the axon causes slowed response. So the time between the application of the stimulus and the occurrence of the evoked potential is actually assessing the nerve's functioning capability. And the slow time is characteristically seen in, uh, in multiple sclerosis, particularly seen in 70 to 90% of the patients. So how do we do this evoked potential test? So we can do this three ways um, by either visual, auditory, or somatosensory. So for visual, a checkerboard pattern of light and dark squares may be placed on a TV monitor. For auditory, sounds can be played through an earphone. And for somatosensory, electrical stimuli can be uh, placed on their hands and feet of the patients. So now moving on to the treatment. So for multiple sclerosis, it's important to note that there is both medical and non-medical treatment. And when it comes to non-medical treatment, such as physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy, this is also very important to suggest and ask the patients to follow because it will help with the activities of daily living. It will also help them with their muscles and motor function and can also help them build out a very effective support system. When it comes to drug therapy, there's immunomodulating drugs, drugs for symptomatic treatment, and also drugs for acute exacerbations. So an easy way to remember the immunomodulating drugs is ABCN, the acronym, so Avonex, Betaseron, and Copaxon. So Betaseron was actually one of the first medications to be approved, and these are of the um, interferon class. So we can see here interferons, they act by downregulating the expression of the MHC action and also the action of cytokines. Uh, we can see here that copaxone induces the suppressor T cells and that elizomat inhibits the endothelial binding of the T cells. So all in all, the role of these medications is to try and prevent the immune process from occurring. 
And this is just a timeline showing here that beta seron in 1993 was one of the first medications approved and uh, they were injections. So green are in the injections. And as we've progressed over time, we have now come to more and more oral forms of medication for multiple sclerosis. For symptomatic treatment, so whenever we have patients presenting with spasticity, bodily dysfunction, any of these medications can be prescribed depending on their symptoms and, of course, their other medical conditions. And for drugs for acute exacerbations, glucocorticoids, methylprednisolone, and prednisone can also be used. And uh, this is um, just a, a key recommendation for practice that I've obtained from the American Academy of Family Physicians, just showing level A evidence that corticosteroids are the treatment of choice for significant acute symptoms and disease modifying agents such as interferon beta and copaxone, as we've just discussed, are also shown to decrease the frequency of exacerbations and progression of disease in patients with multiple sclerosis. So in the new, so it's very exciting time for multiple sclerosis research as it's a, it's a medical condition that does not have a cure. And there's a lot of research being conducted across the globe in attempts of finding medication that will improve the symptoms and possibly even find a cure for patients. And uh, what I'm gonna discuss are um, clinical trials that are currently underway. Um, they, they do look promising, but more uh, trials, especially on human populations may need to be performed. So first and foremost is mRNA vaccine treatment. Yes, I'm, I'm sure you're probably thinking mRNA for multiple sclerosis. And to be, um, to be sure about this here, the Biotech and Pfizer co company who is actually creating the COVID-19 vaccines have proposed the same technology to develop a therapeutic approach for multiple sclerosis. What they did is they use a mice, mice model, model and they used a multiple sclerosis like disease uh, with experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis. They call this the EAE mice. They used a specialized messenger RNA coding for this disease in an attempt to release autoantigens to prevent the immune system from attacking the myelin. The results that they found was that the ability to suppress and reduce the severity of multiple sclerosis like disease. A further progression could also prevent, um, further, further disease progression could also be prevented in these mice with reduction in demyelination in the spinal cord and also restoration of motor function. This um, article was actually published in the Journal of Science in uh, 2021. Considerable testing is still needed for human populations. Uh, next, we have here the octopus trial. It's a UK mega trial. It's the first um, octopus trial to be conducted by the MS Society, and this was announced in March of this year. It's a multi or multi stage design. And um, what they're doing here is after 18 months, they will be examining the, the MRI of the patients to see if there's any slowed worsening of, this, of the lesions and to see if even uh, nerve, repair, uh, nerve repair can be assessed. And finally, we have here NVG291. Um, this is a small uh, um, biotech company in Canada called NerveGen, and they're actually um, proposing something that's very unique. The concept is to promote remyelination or the regeneration of lost myelin. And so far, there's no trials that I've seen that, that are attempting to, to assess this. So that the trial medication is a peptide. It's a small protein that's called the protein tyrosine phosphatase sigma. And this normally blo blocks the nerve repair following injury. So the investigations have demonstrated that this NVG291-like compound can promote the remyelination in mouse models of multiple sclerosis. So we see here that research has been conducted and currently is still um, going on in, in animal models and um, prospects, future prospects in human models are still to be tested. So these are my references. And I'd like to end off with some neuron humor. So neurons are superheroes except when they're busy, of course. Thank you for your time and have a fantastic day.